Hey, we, uh, we're continuing our series Squad Goals tonight, Squad Goals Part 2, and uh, as we looked at last week, if you were here, I talked about what a negative friend is and what a toxic friend can do, and tonight we're going to flip that around a little bit and talk about positive friendships and what a positive friend looks like, and I'm going to leave you with one big point at the end, but first, I just want to tell you guys, I mean, you're awesome. You guys, you guys realize that, right? Like you, yeah, some of you are like, yes, yes, I am. Yes, I am. You, you're awesome. Like you guys are coming here on a Tuesday night. There's tons of other things you could be doing with your time, like Netflix or sleeping or homework that you love so much. There's so many other things you could do. And not only are you here worshiping God with us, playing games, having fun, but you've been listening to adults talk to you at school all day, and now you've got to listen to another boring adult talk to you again. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. I know. And, and, and I want to tell you guys, I really admire that in you. Because maybe you realize that you're coming here for your friends, you're coming here for the games, you're coming here for the music, but maybe you also might come to learn a little bit. And, and if you listen to, to me or to your hub leaders, you might find that you do learn, not because we're super geniuses or we're going to teach you the, these things that we know. It's because that we've been following God and we know some deep truths that we can teach you. And tonight, I want to focus around a word. Uh, this word is perseverance. You anyone know what the word perseverance means? To, to persevere is to keep trying even in the face of obstacles. So I saw this documentary once. Uh, it was a true story. It definitely happened. Um, and in this documentary, there's this one real-life person. His name is Yoda. And Yoda, oh, it really happened. Yoda is all about perseverance. He's got a really famous line. He says, do or do not, there is no try. And he kind of says it like, you know, like he gets that, like, you guys can all try the Yoda voice real quick. It's just, yeah, like Master Luke, yeah. Yes. Now, hold on. Shh. Now, guys in the room, quick tip. When you go to high school and you ask a girl to a dance, if you ask her in the Yoda voice, she'll definitely say no. Okay, so, um, and... <clears throat> So what I want to do, when we talk about perseverance, when we talk about perseverance, we want to think about the idea of doing something over and over, even when we're failing, so that we can get it right eventually. And I want to talk to you about four people tonight that really persevered. I want to see if you can get, these are people that you probably know about, so we're going to play a little game here. Uh, I'm going to read a description of a person. You're going to see if you can figure out who this person is, okay? And then I'll ask you, and you can try to share. Okay. Person one, this person achieved great success at a young age. When he was 20 years old, he started a company in his parents' garage, and within a decade, his co company that he started in a garage was worth $2 billion. But, but at age 30, at age 30, you got to listen, you won't know who it is. The tech company's board of directors decided to take the business in a different direction, and he's fired from this company. He was fired from the company he started. Did you catch that? So then he creates this company called Next and a company called Pixar. And then Next was bought out by his old company. He goes back, ends up becoming the head of this company, and creates something that most of you have in your pockets right now. That person, that person is Steve Jobs. So, and yes, the founder of Apple. So here's the next person. Ready? Shh. Okay. Person two. This person is, is going to get easy. This person created an animation company that went bankrupt. At one point, he's starving and had to eat dog food. He created a famous cartoon character, but people originally rejected it because they said that his cartoon mouse would scare the women. Then, this is a true story. Women are afraid of mice. I'm actually terrified of mice. My wife is not. Uh, so, this person kept pressing on and created one of the most famous animated movies of all time. Any ideas? Walt Disney. Walt Disney. Okay. Here's person three. Person three. This person is currently the second richest woman on earth, but 
When she wrote her first book in 1995, it was rejected by 12 different publishers. Even Bloomsbury, this really small publishing company that eventually bought her book, told her, go get a day job. You won't make it as a writer. So she kept writing anyway. Most of you in the room have read one of her books. Any ideas? J.K. Rowling, who wrote a book called Harry Potter. Okay. Now, here's person four, last one. Okay, this one's hard. Okay, we ready? Person four. This person really liked hamburgers, loved them. He had a great friend, and he really wanted to get his friend, Mr. Ward, to like his favorite burger as well. His friend kept rejecting the burger, but eventually this person was able to persuade Mr. Ward to enjoy the burger. Any ideas? SpongeBob SquarePants. Now, now, SpongeBob. His friend Squidward, Mr. Ward, he tried to get into like a crabby pad. Okay. So, so bring it back. Shh. Now, I know that was challenging. Okay. We have these four different people. Shh. We have these four different people. They represent perseverance in some way, right? And when we think about the word perseverance, we think they want it bad enough that they're going to be creative they're going to keep working. Even when it seems like they hit a brick wall, they're not going to, they're going to figure out a way to go over it or around it. And so there's a story in the Bible I want to talk to you about tonight that, that kind of reminds me of perseverance. And uh, when I try to read my Bible, I try to read it like it's a, a movie or a story. I, I, I really like telling stories. I like hearing stories. I like seeing stories on film. And uh, I know a lot of you guys too, and so I try to imagine the Bible as a story. So tonight, uh, in hub groups, you might get a chance to, to open up your Bibles and look at the story. But tonight, I, I don't need you to open your Bibles and find it right now. I just want you to listen. And I'm going to try to tell you a story, right? I'll tell it from kind of a movie perspective, as if we had a film of this story happening. So, if we're imagining this as a movie, we're zoomed in. There's this spot where Jesus and his followers are. So Jesus has been walking around and doing some pretty amazing things. And people have figured out that he can not only turn water into wine, he can make bread multiply and fish multiply. He can heal people. He's even raised people from the dead. People are seeing these miracles that Jesus is doing. So the Bible, this book that was written, this history book that was written multiple thousand years ago, tells the story of Jesus. He's standing there. And it, if we're panning out a little bit, we see this guy kind of walking towards Jesus, and it, he looks just, his flesh is mutilated. It's almost hanging off of his face. We're seeing people running in different directions as he starts approaching Jesus. And this person with this skin disease gets to Jesus, and he says, take mercy on me. And Jesus feel sorry for the man. He reaches out his hand, and the man's skin heals. And Jesus tells him, hey, don't tell anyone what I just did. Okay, you got that? Don't tell anyone what I just did. And it pans out as we see this guy's face. He's like, oh, I'm telling people. And he starts running into town saying, listen, that guy back there just healed me. He healed me. Go find him. Go find him right now. And Jesus is seeing this going, uh-oh, can't all right, we can't be here, so it's time to move on. So his disciples, the people following him, they start moving. And they start going to this next town. And so they're in this house, and they're teaching. Jesus is teaching people about God's love for them. And there's just a few people in this house. But if we pan back out, we're starting to see hundreds of people walking through the desert, heading toward where they think Jesus is. Dust is flying up. His sandaled feet are hitting the ground one after another after another. Children are jumping. They're so excited to see this guy who can do some miracles. The camera stops on the house where Jesus is teaching. It'll zoom in. Jesus is sitting there talking about God's love. The lady of the house has a big smile on her face. She's satisfied with the, the food that's on the, the fire. They're getting ready to eat. And all of a sudden, we hear shouts from outside the house. In here, found him, found him. This is him. It's the one. Jesus is in here, and within seconds, we have person after person after person filing through this house. 
look of terror on the woman's face who owns this property. And the house fills up. The woman's smile goes away. She's worried about how she's going to feed all these unexpected guests. And Jesus tries to ignore the crowd and keeps on teaching. And as he continues to teach, someone from the back says, we didn't come to hear you teach. Do something cool. We came to see what you can do. Jesus keeps teaching. The camera moves back. We see in the outskirts, we see four silhouettes running towards the house as fast as they can. We look a little bit closer. It looks like they're carrying something. They're carrying a tarp. In all four of their hands, they've got an edge of the tarp, and inside the tarp is another man. He's not moving. They're running to the house to get their friend to Jesus. They get there. They think that the crowd is going to move, but the crowd doesn't. The crowd just bunches closer together. Some people even spit on the man who's on the tarp. They're yelling insults at him. They're not letting people into the house. We go back inside the house. We see this look of disappointment on Jesus' face. We look like he's recognizing he doesn't want the crowd there. They're there for the wrong reasons. And right as we think that Jesus is going to walk away, we hear this crack and we see chunks of dirt and grass and tile falling from the ceiling. The camera pans up a little bit, and we see the four men with the tarp ripping open the ceiling, the the roof, lowering the man down through the roof so that he can see Jesus. They realize that their friend's been paralyzed. He hasn't been able to move for a long, long time. We see Jesus look down at the man. He looks at the men on the roof. He nods approvingly, and he says, your sins are forgiven. The men at the roof start scratching their head. They're like, dude, we we thought he would heal him. Why did he just say your sins are forgiven? And so then we hear this muffled whisper from the corner of the room. The camera's going to shift over a little bit, and we see these dudes in these white robes sitting there, shaking their head disapprovingly and whispering. Jesus stares coldly at them. We're on the edge of our seat at this point. We're watching this, and we're thinking there's going to be a brawl in the middle of this poor woman's living room. And then Jesus says, hey, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. And he looks back at the man. He says, look, your sins were the important part. I forgave you for what you've done. But now, to show show what I can do, here we go. Get up and walk. And the man in disbelief starts standing up and he can walk for the first time in 20 years. He picks up his mat and he exits the house. There's gasping and cheering from the crowd as they saw the miracle that they came to see and it fades to black. Man, what a cool story. This this story is found in your Bibles. It's in the book of Luke. It's the third biography that was written about Jesus. And, And real quick, as we close tonight, I want us to think about what we can learn from this story. And, and I only want to really ask a couple questions. And when I'm looking at this story, because for me, I, I try to read it, I see it as a story, and then I go, okay, how can this story apply to me? What can I learn from it? What do I need to do or make a change in my life? Or how can this story affect me? And, and I think there's four big characters in the story besides Jesus that we want to look at. And, and I think that almost every one of us in this room are in one of these four spots tonight. I don't care where you came from, uh, what your background is, whether you're a Christian, you're not a Christian, whether you love God, you're indifferent to God, you don't know God, you hate God. I think all four of us, or all of us, can relate to one of these four people. The first is the crowd. And so we see spectators that are standing in the way of people that want to meet Jesus. There's truly needy people. This guy on the mat, he can't get to Jesus because the crowd has bunched up and they've closed out the entrances. Now, the crowd, notice they're not actually having their lives changed by Jesus. They just wanted to get close enough to watch him. And I think there's a lot of us in this room that try to follow Jesus a little bit, because right now it's the cool thing to do. It's right, right now in this moment, following Jesus can be cool. There's crazy games, there's cool conferences, there's great worship bands, there's fun activities. All our friends are here. It's a cool thing to do. But we don't 
if we're really honest with ourselves, we're not actually following Jesus. We're just trying to get close enough where he might impact us a little bit. And then worse than that, we're blocking people from meeting Jesus. Some of us in the room, your friends are trying to worship, and you're messing around. You're pulling them away from Jesus. Some of your friends are trying to share something in your small groups and hub groups, and you're messing around. You're pulling them away from Jesus. Some of your friends see you as a Christian at school, but you're acting completely opposite of how you act on a Tuesday night, and you're pulling your friends away from Jesus. Some of you are blocking your friends from getting to see Jesus. You might be the crowd. The second thing you might be is a Pharisee. Those are those guys in the white robes. So the super religious dudes. They have no relationship with Jesus, but they're really good at religion and rules. And they follow every rule. They had rules about the rules about the rules. They would sit there like this and mock Jesus and sit there and question and argue. And they showed up. They didn't want to see a miracle. They just wanted to argue with Jesus. They just wanted to question him. Some of you in the room tonight might be in a place where you're judging other people who are trying to follow Jesus. You're sitting there, you're laughing at people when they're worshiping, or you're glaring at the new kid that comes into youth group, or you're spending all your energy criticizing Christians. You might, you might be a Pharisee. The third thing that you might be is the paralyzed man. See, this guy, we notice that when he's lowered through the roof, Jesus could have simply just been like, hey, go get up, walk, go home. But what he does first is he says, hey, your sins are forgiven. Sins are those things that we do wrong that separate us from God's love. Because God is perfect and holy and he can't be around sin. And so when we sin, we're separate from him. And so Jesus says to this guy, hey, your sins are forgiven. Because your sin is literally making you sick. And that's the thing about sin. Our sin may not turn us into a physical, physical ailment. It may not paralyze us physically but it's paralyzing our hearts. It's stopping our hearts from really doing what they're supposed to do. It's stopping them from beating fully in a life that follows Jesus. And so some of you in this room, you're sick. Your sin has made you sick. And you might be like this paralyzed man that needs forgiveness. You might need to turn and say, I got to get to Jesus tonight. I don't even know how. I might need my friend's help. I might need my leader's help, but I got to get to Jesus tonight. And you might need to be made right with God. Or the fourth, you might be the friends. And we know, what we notice about these friends, this is the, where that perseverance comes in, right? They couldn't get in the normal way. But they loved their friend enough that they were going to climb up, go through the tiling, and go through the roof. And the houses back then usually have these flat roofs, and so they're climbing the stairway to get to the top. They found another way in. They didn't even care that they were wrecking this poor woman's house because they knew what was more important than a house was their friend's heart and his healing and being made right with God. And so these friends don't permit the difficult circumstances to discourage them. Are you like them? I mean, that's, that's who hopefully we want to be like. Are the people that are doing everything possible to get your sick friend to Jesus? And the question for you is, if you're a Christian tonight, are you doing everything possible to get your sick friends to Jesus? Because the reality is, if your friends do not know God, they're sick. The, they, the sin in their life is paralyzing them. Do you care enough to try to get them to Jesus? Or are you going to be like the crowd and prevent them? Because a real friend is not going to let any obstacle stand in the way of showing their friends who Jesus is. A real friend, when we're talking about squad goals and what real friends do, a real friend is going to bring their other friends to Jesus. And that's what we see these guys do.